Welcome to the Empathic Mastery Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Moore, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a place where we talk about what it means to be highly sensitive and empathic, how this impacts all aspects of our lives, and we explore tools, resources, and solutions so we can shift from absorbing all the thoughts, feelings, and energy of the world around us to being beacons for calm, love, and healing. Hey there, everybody. I'm back with another episode of the Empathic Mastery Show. And today I've got a particularly interesting conversation for you with Katish Haberfield. So Katish is a specialist in complex soul-based prognosis. We'll have to find out what that actually means. She is a finder of soul obstructions in all incarnations at the quantum level. Katish locates the root cause of seemingly invisible and inexplicable mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual issues using her bespoke application of apometrics. Katish, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Jen. I'm just, I can't wait to get into it. And I was, you know, obviously I've known you for a little while and we've been sort of around somewhat similar healing circles and places, but I've never really heard your story. And so I was like, I really want to hear your story. I'm really interested in kind of how did this all begin for you? So I always love starting at the beginning, starting with what was it like to be a little Katish? Were you a really, did you know you were really sensitive? What was the experience like? Do you identify specifically as an empath? And if yes, when did you realize you were an empath? And if no, how do you define yourself? Mm, really good question. And it's a question I pondered yesterday, Jen. And the reason that I pondered that yesterday is because I have this kind of idyllic glossy version of my childhood, which I know from experience is my filtered perception of childhood. And so I thought I would ask myself, what is the objective answer to the question, what was your childhood like and what were your empath as a child? And literally only two days ago, I picked up um, and opened my Kindle reader and opened up to a chapter of a book that I had just downloaded a sample of, which was by Napoleon Hill. Mm -hmm. Now, Napoleon Hill is famous for a particular book, Think and Grow Rich. Right. Except this was not the book. Huh. This, this book is the book that came after and was never published until recently. And it's called Outwitting the Devil. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And I was like, interesting. And the reason that I'm talking about this is it answers my question about empaths. So Napoleon Hill couldn't implement his own recommendations from his famous book. He struggled mentally his entire life with why he was a failure until he had a conversation with the devil. Now, I have had a conversation with the devil. I know how nasty that can be. So I knew what he was going to write in that book would be the truth. But the first thing that he said in there was something that I didn't know until two days ago. That is, put aside all of your understanding of the higher self and the inner child. Let's just look at your personality, who you are in this incarnation. So most of us just talk about the ego, but actually there's yeah. two selves. There's the ego self and what he calls the other self. Now, the ego self is the self that aligns with fear, negativity, anger, jealousy, and all the things that we would consider as the dark side of life. Mm -hmm. The other self aligns with the light side of life, the joy, the hope, the happiness, the love, because without we can't have dark without light. And so I said, oh, this is an interesting concept. I know people try to kill the ego, and I've always thought that was wrong because the ego has a lot to teach you. So let me ask, now that I've discovered this other self, let me ask the other self about my childhood because I feel there's a story there that I don't know yet. And I think Jen will be interested in this story. Yeah. Because I want to know about was I an empathic child? Yeah. And I know I'm an empathic adult, but was I an empathic child? It seems to be glossed over in my mind. So I met my other self and other self showed me an image of him laying across like a 
uh, fallen log in a forest, really mossy, and he was wearing green like a fairy's outfit, like an elf, you know? And he's, like, just lying there like, oh, my God, finally, have we finally, oh, I've been waiting only 47 years. Thank you for acknowledging (laughs) my existence. I was like, oh, okay, sorry. I said, all right, well, I've got a good question for you for our first introductory discussion. What was I like as a child? Was I an empath? And he said, well, my dear, you were ignoring me, so you'll have to go ask your ego self that. (laughs) I was like, oh, well, I do apologise in retrospect that I was ignoring you, but thank you. And I went and had a conversation with the ego self, which was for an entire day. And what I think you'll find interesting is the ego self said to me, you were a totally empathic child. Yeah. And I was like, okay, all right, that's interesting. Uh, Because I have this uh, perspective of my childhood as being completely blessed because I didn't go through anything in my mind that was negative in my childhood, which is Mm -hmm. rare, right? Rare, very rare. Rare, very rare. I have nothing to complain about in my childhood, really. When I look back, you know, uh, mother and father who stayed together, lived in a peaceful, civilized, non-warring nation, got a good education, had a loving sister, nobody died, all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. But I do remember that I was always a very serious child. Yes. And um, I always could feel sadness. Mm Mm-hmm. And I have always been tapped into and being able to sense sadness, fear, anger, and anxiety in other people. Yes. And so what my uh, ego self said, which was very interesting, he said, the sadness of an empathic child is a reflection of the perception of the sadness of humanity. Yes. Smart ego self. So I was like, okay, tell me more about that. (laughs) <laughs> because I do remember that in university, two of my closest friends, one of which I'm still very, very close with, she used to nickname me Eeyore. So that fits mm. in, right? Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't say that I was a depressed person because I always looked for the light. I've always been looking for the light and happiness and joy, but I've never felt like I could really grapple with the emotions of happiness and joy and fun and lightness and spontaneity. I always felt like I took the world incredibly seriously and incredibly personally. So I am talking to the ego self and the ego self said, well, as a child, you put yourself in situations where you could absorb the sadness of others. That's a really interesting piece way to say that, that you put yourself into situations where you could absorb the sadness of others. Mm. Not that you were in situations where you absorbed the sadness of others, but that you put yourself in those situations. What a fascinating clarification. Mm. And they showed me a scene, which I went back to straight away, which was a scene in grade five. We had a mountable classroom, which is, you know, so it's up on high steps because it's a a temporary solution when a school is growing. And I remember I had this one little friend and we were racing back to class to line up to go in after break or recess, whatever you want to call it. And there was a chain, you know, like a steel chain to uh, that mm-hmm. marked the grass area. And yeah. for some known reason that day, she jumped over that chain and fell flat on her face and broke her tooth. Oh. And I was the first person there. Mm-hmm. And I took her to the dentist, which we had an on-site school clinic that day, just supposedly was there just that very day. happened to be that way. Wow. Yeah. Um, And I've always felt like people as an adult that I dated, I tended to rescue. Yes. Yeah. And then there was something else that was interesting. Sorry, there's a lot of stories here and stop me when you, I was then told that um, the next example that flashed in, I saw my childhood um, house and I was like, oh, this is interesting. I have dragons that I work with. And the dragon that I work with closely at the moment, he said another dragon's name and said this particular dragon remembers a memory that will be a great example. I was like, Wonderful. I had a dragon around me there. So you can see I'm oblivious. Yeah. 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 Yes. You've always had a dragon around you, my dear, and it lived in the garden. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, but it will probably send you mad with the sadness of it. And I was like, what do you mean? 
I think I'm pretty strong and resilient. I'll be able to cope with it. And they they wouldn't tell me, but then they flashed a scene in my mind, a, a, lots of different scenes, but one was when the day that my dad walked into my room where we woke up with, an, with the announcement that my grandmother had died. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I remember seeing his red eyes and I knew that he had been crying and I remember thinking distinctly, dad is trying to be brave for us. And what the dragon said is that at that moment I absorbed his sadness around the death of his mother, but then there was something else that was around me that made that sadness compound even more. And I was like, okay, all right, I'll just park that thought for a minute. But interesting that I absorbed my dad's sad- sadness and there's something else that I need to know. And I was like, okay. And I said, does that have anything to do with, you know, the fact that I spent a lot of room- time in my room or in the garden as a child. And when I was in my room, I was like in a bubble and I was reading all fairy stories, always fairy stories, you know, Enid Blyton, Magic Pudding, Faraway Tree, and I loved Noddy and the Famous Five, and I was always a detective because my mind always has to solve puzzles. And when I was reading, the world was was uh, couldn't touch me, yeah. and that was that was my joy. The fairies, um, I knew that adults didn't think they existed, but I knew that provided me with joy. I knew that I couldn't see them or hear them, but I sensed that they were real. Uh, and I like to be around them. But I also knew that I was terribly, terribly afraid of the dark. Mm. And I knew that there were monsters under my bed and in my wardrobe. Yep. <laughs> and that I was so, so scared that I would have to get my dad, who was at the other end of the hallway, because my mum was sleeping unaware, every time I needed to wake up in the middle of the night or I woke up with a fright, I would yell out, Mommy, Daddy, I need to go to the toilet. And dad would run down the end of the hall and take me to the toilet, which was opposite my bedroom because I was afraid of the monsters in the dark. I also knew that if I went for a daytime nap on the weekend, my dad was a legendary napper, all the Happerfields are legendary nappers on a Saturday or a Sunday, that I would go to sleep, have a nap, and I would wake up with what was called, I self-termed, sleeping sickness, Mm -hmm. which meant that I felt sick after a midday nap. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is all starting to come together again. Why could I be very, why could I feel these monsters? Why could I feel feel the negativity? Why could I feel the sadness? Why could I feel the monsters? Were the monsters real? And my ego self said, yes, your house was, you were surrounded by a house full of ghosts and red eyes. Now, red eyes are the negative beings that people sometimes see that have red eyes. And the sleeping sickness, this is the first time I learned this yesterday, was when the red eye entities tried to penetrate your aura. Mm, mm -hmm. And when when a negative entity tries to penetrate your aura, which is your shield, the bacteria that's on them from being in the umbral or the lower astral realms makes you feel sick. So Uh what you're feeling is the bacteria around the negative entities. So my next question was, why was my house full of ghosts? Did we move into a house full of ghosts? Yeah. Yeah. Did we move into a house full of ghosts? (laughs) And then they're like, well, you know, the logical and rational rational answer is because of your vibrational match. Yes, I got it. All right, why did I have such a low vibrational match? And then the kicker question was, where did the ghosts come from? And I always get the, do you really want to know? Because they don't want to tell me. Do you really want to know? I'm like, yes, you need to tell me right now where did these ghosts come from? And I flashed a scene in my mind and it all began to make sense. They took me to a little country town in the state of New South Wales in Australia. I live in Queensland. But both my mother and father grew up in a particular state in in, uh, Australia called New South Wales. And so there are all the ancestors on both sides of the family. And when I was six years old, I went to the graveyard. It's called the Pioneer Cemetery. And I remember to this day going to that graveyard because I was fascinated with the headstones and they showed me all the ancestors on the Haberfield side and the ancestors on the Gray side, which is this is just my dad's side of the family because this was the my dad's side of the family were Methodists and my mum's side of the family were Catholic. So the Catholic were in a different cemetery, right? Yep. So we're just on the Methodist side. <laughs> and they said... 
when I walk past the grey family headstones, 23 ghosts followed me home and have been with me ever since. Oh, my goodness. And I said, they're with me right now because, you know, I'm the specialist in ghosts. And they're like, they're still with you right now. And I was like, oh, my goodness, because I learn every day a new level about ghosts. I was like, okay, so I can sense negative energy because I've had deceased people around me since I was six years old. That's why I can sense sadness. Ghosts feel sad. If a ghost goes past me, like my mum had an operation this week and I had to go and pick her up, I burst into tears in the turning circle to pick her up because a ghost floated past me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. how empathic I am. I can feel the distress of a ghost. Yes. So that's kind of part of my story to answer the question, was I empathic as a child? And the answer is yes, because I could feel negative feelings. I could always feel sadness, fear, anger, and anxiety. Yes. Yes. Does that make sense? That totally makes sense. And you've just said so many amazing things about like that picking up ghosts and sort of you end up with these clinger, you know, these hanger oners and everything. And, and like, if we don't deal with them, they're still with us. And just all of, I love how you're also talking about the idea that not only, because I, I was saying this to you before we jumped on, onto the hit record, but how so many people, I think, think about being an empath in terms of the scene world, the living beings that they're picking up the negativity, the thoughts, feelings, energy, and sensations from. But what you're talking about, which is such an important piece of conversation, is the fact that as empaths, we're not necessarily only vulnerable to picking up the energy of the living, but we are also vulnerable to picking up the energy of the deceased. And that, you know, we can, we're sensitive to ghosts in a way that other people aren't. So it sounds like you got a whole, like, I, a, a minion of ghosts. <laughs> like, you got a team around you at the age of six. How do you see, like, I'd love to hear about the, so so you had, you picked up the ghosts. You were really sensitive to the sadness. You were aware of kind of that sort of, I don't know, the darkness, for lack of a better word, at a very, very early age. And, but there was, there's the in-between of like there and now where you are, for lack of a better word, you know, you're this like multi-dimensional soul, you know, like Ghostbuster, where (laughs) you're, you're doing all of this work around, as you were saying, you know, soul obstructions, working with multiple incarnations, like working, working, it sounds like addressing and working with ancestral issues working with the, you know, those who are, have not been able to cross over as well as past life stuff. Um, but I'd love to hear about that in-between period, the, the mm. stage like where you decide to go to university and you try to do the normal thing and yeah. go into a conventional field and all that. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing I just want to clarify for the listeners is that I cannot see ghosts. Yeah. Okay. So my ability to pick up is not based on like a traditional medium who can see ghosts. It's literally the feeling, you know, I can feel their energy, right? Um, Just so people don't think, oh, she's just one of these really gifted mediums who can see. No, I can't see ghosts. I can hear them and I can feel them and I get a visceral bodily uh, reaction. So, no, I, I had no understanding of this ability until very recently, two years ago. Wow. So very, very straight-laced childhood in terms of, uh, I know you talked to other guests about non-religious background. So my parents, one was Protestant, one was Catholic. They, My dad took me to church and then dropped me off and sat in the car reading the paper. He said it was his his job to give me a religious education, but he'd been through it and no thank you, he didn't want to go there again, and that I could uh, tell him when I'd had enough, and I did. And then he's like, right, okay, done. Um, I went to a lovely uh, school. I had an obsession with a particular little boy from the minute I met him and he's still a friend today. I now know he's a past life son. Uh Uh-huh. 
Uh huh. The only other indication that I could tell you that I knew anything about anything was that one day I was in the garden as a little girl and I remember squashing a bug and I said out loud, oh, my goodness, I've just killed my mum or grandma or something like that. That's the only other thing I could think of from childhood that would indicate that I had any awareness of different dimensions. I was not interested in anything like that. I was just a very straight-laced child who was trying to do their best. I knew that I always fell over. I was always hurting myself. I was always in accidents, you know, where I would run into a pole or skid my knee on something. I was described as the clumsy kid, you know. I knew that I was the child that tried really hard but didn't seem to get anywhere in any in anything, okay? People would describe me as handsome, not pretty. Mm-hmm. They would use masculine descriptors for me, not feminine, which I always felt really uh, strange about. There's yeah. a reason for that. Hopefully that will come up later. But um, I could, yeah, I people had reactions to me that was either they outright hated me or they loved me. And generally people have come, have kind of been perplexed about me. They've been like, oh, she's got different facing personalities. She can be cunning and strategic and show a side to people that shows different qualities and can have a different quality when she's at home with friends. I felt like I have an extroverted external personality with an introverted heart. Mm -hmm. And so childhood, beautiful childhood, my parents moved overseas to Papua New Guinea when I was in grade, at the end of grade nine. So I spent my final years in high school in boarding school, which I loved. Um, Then I went to university. I did a bachelor's degree in business, majoring in marketing. I just did, you know, 5.0. We have a 7.0 scale, so average student. I was always average. And then after that, I decided to, I got got high enough. I couldn't get a job, which is a theme of my life, never been able to get a a proper job. Uh, So I went back to university again and I did my master's degree. When I did my master's degree, we started to click into life a little bit because I I got the Dean's Award for Academic and Excellence. So I was like, okay, I'm smart. All right, maybe I'm meant to be a teacher, an mm. academic. So I, I went into academia um, and management consulting. I, I was my first job was with um, Accenture, the world's largest management consulting firm. So again, very straight laced, conservative uh, sort of things. I worked in the dot com world for a couple of years until the Nasdaq crash in t- two thousand, mm-hmm. and then I was like, okay, the world's not ready for my skills because we were trying to get the internet on your mobile phone. Online shopping didn't exist back then, aging right. myself. But um, I was like, well, the world doesn't need my skills for a while. And my friend gave me a copy of that book, uh, What Color Is Your Parachute or whatever it's called. Yes, 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 yeah. exactly that book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where I was like, she's like, okay, you want to you wanna find a new career? You've got to follow your joy. And literally I went, well, my joy is eating cheese and drinking wine. Uh, let me see if I can make a career out of that. <laughs> Now, that was kind of made sense because I'm from a third generation. Well, actually, when you look back on the Irish ancestry, all the way, dairy people. So my father's family, we had a a dairy company where we produced cheese for 75 years. So cheese was not a stupid answer. No, not at all. Yeah. So I went back to university again and I studied uh, viticulture, wine making and wine, wine marketing at university. And then I also did Le Cordon Bleu and did a graduate certificate in gastronomy and studied the history of food and wine and history, you know, and how that intersects. So I thought maybe I'd be like a food writer or wine writer or something. But this is interesting about empathic and senses. The thing that uh, disappointed me the most was when I was at residential in South Australia, where the wine university was, you had to do a week long of wine tasting where you would uh, bl- blind testing, um, you'd have to take a sip of the wine, spit it out, obviously, and then you'd get a paper and you had to describe everything about that wine, get the vintage right, the soil right, the grape variety, you know, yes. everything. Yes, yes. And I remember getting my marks back from the white wine tasting panel and reading my description of, um, was it Riesling? Riesling, Riesling, sorry. And I wrote, this wine is flabby, lacks in acidity. And the Mark, I wrote, well, I don't think you're going to be a sommelier because this wine has searing acidity. I was like, okay, so taste isn't my best sense. So that was interesting. Um, And literally from that point on, 
uh, has been trying to find what I'm meant to do, in and out and in and out of jobs, nothing working, being faced with every kind of obstacle possible and having friends who are in my master's class watching me who are now the CEOs of major international corporations going, what the heck is going on with this girl? Right. Um, Not being able to succeed in anything, Um, being faced with both personal and financial obstructions to a level that would send somebody insane. And it was when we got to lockdown for 2000, and I hear a lot of this from people that I'm meeting, that it's kind of like my soul took a breather and said, right, let's introduce you to your best sense, which is hearing. Mm. And that's how I started with sound healing. And I got a qualification in crystal singing bowls, sound healing. Mm -hmm. And from there, it's as though I've lived 100 lifetimes in three years because everything has led to everything else from that. But sound is my primary sense. Yes. Um, And that is what has, when I learn something spiritually now, I hear it through, I learn it through sound. That is what is, that's what activates me. And that's Mm -hmm. where, that's a very fast version of where we get to, to uh, sound is the first step into my spiritual world. So I was uh, 44 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I began to realise, oh, I'm interested in this spiritual stuff and, ah, I can access all this stuff that I had no imagination that I could and I can do really easy as though I've lived before. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about the struggle and because I think that this is something I know a lot of people who are highly sensitive empaths go through this. The It just like career does not land as easily. There's like all of this process and just like back and forth and trying to find the place to fit. I'd be really interested in hearing because I'm imagining you've done a lot of work on this, that you've looked into this. Why? Like, you know, you said you had all these friends and, and, you know, colleagues who classmates who were looking at you and like, what is it with this girl that she just keeps on, you know, jumping from one thing to another and trying so many things and just not able to find a shoe that fits for her? I'm imagining you've done some work around this, that you've done some, you know, you've done some talking to the ego, talking to the other self, talking to the devil. What did you learn? What did you discover? Why has this been so hard? Okay, there's multiple things. But if you, the main thing is that I needed to clear for myself all of the energy that was ripe to be healed in this lifetime from other lifetimes. Yes. So anything that I possibly could have faced, there was actually spiritual meaning behind it. And for me, and I'm not saying that this is normal, each and every obstacle that I faced was something in a past life that was ready to be healed. Mm-hmm. Literally every single thing. Mm-hmm. Right down, mm-hmm. right down to the number of people I dated post divorce. Everything was intricable. In, Oh, I can't even speak. Inexplicably. In, yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's linked, the linked to particular lifetimes. I think the, the thing is, and if there's nothing else that anyone else takes away from this entire podcast, irrespective of your beliefs, blocks, be they by negative entities, limiting beliefs, devices, or anything, are a blessing in disguise. Yes. Because they have a message. Mm -hmm. That message is really important and if you are being blocked in your life, it is your job to find the root cause of that block because when you unlock that block for yourself, you can help others. The way to find joy in this life and in any lifetime is to help others gain the freedom. Mm. Let's. Re- I just want to hold that up. The way to find any joy in our own life is to help others to find their freedom. Mm-hmm. Preach. Such and, a beautiful and message. For yeah. me, unfortunately, that means that the way my team works is they teach it to me physically first. Yep. So I physically go through what I call tests, trials mm-hmm. and initiations. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
it all comes down to understanding energy and understanding what the soul is and who you were in different incarnations and how energy influences your life. So literally uh, I got originally frustrated with mindfulness because I would say I get it. I've done every mindfulness course on the planet and I call bullshit. There's something more than that. Like I've had arguments with my friend Cindy Porter who I work very closely with where she'll say something to me about it. it's just your vibration, it's just your thought. And I'll say, I'll call bullshit. We need to go to the deeper level. There's yes. something below that. Yes, yes, yes. There is almost always something below. I mean, there's just so many layers to the thing. And it's almost the surface is never where it stops. The surface never. is never where it stops. Yeah. So if you can get out of the victim mode for a moment, which is a whole challenge in itself. Mm-hmm. I understand if you are stuck in victim mode, it's because you have a lot of stuff around you. If you can have that space and be given that grace to be able to, to gain your thoughts and go to the root cause, you will find that thing that is blocking you. Now, for me, it wasn't until I did go into, I don't know if you remember, Around the time of the lockdown, there was this audio-only social media platform. I can't remember what it was called. You could only go on and then you recorded. It was just live rooms where they recorded sound. Um, Clubhouse. It, Clubhouse, that's it. Yeah. And so I was I was like, okay, this, is my, this must be my jam. You know, it's audio-only. But um, I went into a room, set my intention, I'm here to learn. She had a speaker on and I came in and as soon as I came into that room, because you can't see, she said, would the person who just entered the room know that this is my space and you are not welcome? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And I went, well, that's directed at me. I might just leave. And I was like, but I'm a good person. What's possibly, what have I possibly done? And that led to a conversation which led to a conversation where I I was around a spiritual teacher, a beautiful lady, and I won. I won a session with her, a private one-on-one session. And she knew I was having troubles and she had been, her and her husband, her husband has the gift of being able to see what who you were in certain incarnations, right? So he had completely flabbergasted me with me and the entire uh, private room of people who were studying under them a couple of times where he blurted out two of my incarnations and everyone else in the room went, well, that makes sense because I was there too. And I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, okay. And then so I had this private session with her and she's like, okay, let's get to the root cause of whatever this thing is. That what, what, Why is this negative energy around you? What is it? And she she looked at me and she went into my energy because she's a quantum healer, but she sees it in different layers. And she goes, I have to tell you, in 40 years of spiritual work, I have never seen an entity as evil as you are. And I wow. was. Wow. I'm not quite sure how to deal with that. I think I'm a good person. Yeah. And this is where she tried to do something which didn't work, which then led to me to getting a second practitioner to help me. I had a past life possession. Mm -hmm. So a past life possession is where a version of yourself lives in incarnation and then because what they did in that incarnation led to guilt or shame or whatever it is, they self-judge themselves and don't take the invitation to go to the light. Yes. Right? So your energy knows your energy. It's an energy signature. And so when you come down to enter in a new body, if you have a past life around, they can either just gently attach to you or they can forcefully attach and overtake your incarnation. Now, I had a past life possession, which meant that a previous incarnation was really, really, really pissed off and attached themselves to me in the womb. Mm-hmm. Now, it wasn't until I could actually, I was taken into a regression where I went to the womb that I actually physically felt myself in my mother's womb and I screamed as this entity took over me. The womb went black. And to give you a very quick uh, nutshell of what happened was this gentleman was a good person. He was an alchemist and he worked for um, the king. King Edward III, who is very famous for his alchemy and trying to discover the Philosopher's Stone and eternal life. Um, He had, and I spoke about this on on one other podcast only, but the brief version is that he had 
that was the black black plague at the time, and he had queues of people outside his door looking for help. They were dying in front of him, and the king was just obsessed with his wanting to live forever. And I can still see and feel that moment in time where literally it's like his brain cracked at the stress. And to the left of him, I can still see suddenly this magical book appears out of a hole behind a brick, which he does not summon, but these dark magicians summon it to him. He opens it. He gets the information that he needs. He walks out. He gets really mad at all these dying people and thinks that they're about to die anyway, so he just says whatever this black magic says and they all die, Mm. Uh, then walks over to the king and deals with the king's business. From that moment on, the black magicians that were trapped in that book are trapped around the past life of the alchemist. This poor alchemist is actually literally recorded in history. There are stained glass windows of him in the Tower of London and he eventually gets killed by the king and is fed to the lion. I literally have the memory of being eaten alive by the lion. So you can imagine he's pretty pissed off. He tried to do a good lifetime. He tried to help people unbeknownst to forces to him, he was entrapped by black magicians who entrapped him. He then gets fed to the lion by a king who's obsessed with, you know, the philosopher's stone, and it all seems so unreal except for I can remember it. And then I come down to do whatever little Katish is supposed to do. The moment I enter the womb, that the blackness of the black magicians traps me, and then he comes in and he controls my incarnation. Now, what I was taught at the time was that we have done this together, co-created, meaning that he is why I could sense the fear and the negativity because he was attuned to it. We eventually crossed him over forcefully using a practitioner. It was both wonderful and horrendous. I cried for months afterwards because I'd never known anything other than the two of us to coexist together. There was a large gaping hole that was me now missing. And then I suddenly questioned everything I knew. Was I a bad person? And I had to go back into that lifetime to understand his story to unlock the guilt and fear around this black magic stuff. And so my story of why I can access and understand all the negativity begins because I have had a past life possession and it all sort of stems from there. And that's how I can tell if somebody has a past life possession that's how I can tell ghosts, black magic. I can, I can, I know how to work with black magic. That's how I know, I've lo- learned. Basically, from that point on, then I learned all of. So you, a soul has 144 incarnations each time they choose to incarnate with a monad. Right. So a monad has 12 souls. Uh, a monad has a task force. So God creates God source, whatever creates a monad. A monad has 12 unique souls. Each one of those 12 unique souls has 12 avatars or what I call 12 main personalities, and each of those 12 main personalities has 12 incarnations. So you, as Jen, are part of a soul which has 144 incarnations just this time around, this monad. You can be part of a monad as many times as you like, but right now you're involved in one monad here on earth and your soul has 144 incarnations. Mm -hmm. Depending upon your personality, your avatar, you will have chosen to do 12 incarnations or 22 incarnations or whatever. Um, so part of these lifetimes, you will have a really strong knowing that that was you. Mm-hmm. That was my incarnation, mm-hmm. you know. And the other ones you'll be like, well, I can access this and I don't know why. But that's your other 11 mm-hmm. versions of Jen and that's, they have the fierce knowing that it's their incarnations. And so my job for myself has been to heal and help not only my own 144 incarnations so that I could learn the tricks of the trade to do what I do today for other people, to understand black magic, to understand tools that are used against people, to understand how the devil works, to understand this dimension and other, to understand uh, how we incarnate throughout the multiverse, but also to help my monad. 99% of my time is not with clients. It's with my working with my monad to help them. Uh, So I've got myself a little bit lost, but uh, that's how I've taught myself is through personal experience and understanding through demonstrating and healing myself. Uh, And I literally keep copious notes because each feeling, each thought unlocks something 
that I'm being taught by Archangel Michael and the uh, Archangel of my monad about something that I need to heal somebody else with. What a journey. I mean, to go from basically sort of this life in marketing and in wine and cheese to this wake up call where it's like your journey, it sounds like you just had like this absolutely accelerated process where you where it just it just kicked into gear. Um, And I love how you are speaking about just really remembering that every single thing that arises for us is an opportunity. It's like, it is, it is in in many ways, there's a gift in every single one of these things because it is the opportunity to heal it, to deal with it and declare it. And, you know, I'm struck by The fact that within this concept of this previous life, there were two aspects that really seems to have kind of snagged you up. There's the fact that that previous self had the experience of being essentially getting possession from these other entities that were had an agenda, the black magicians, but then also the not crossing over. And so it seems like it was kind of like you had the double whammy of this being not only were they did were they dealing with a possession, but they were also a soul that had not crossed over. So it's sort of like, it's kind of still, it's almost like you've got this bilocation thing going on. Of, yeah, it's of, unfinished business. Yeah, yeah. Un, a lot of unfinished business there. Yeah. So you know, talking about going back to the a piece of conversation, because I can't believe how fast time is whipping by as we're having this conversation. For the for empaths, you know, you were speaking about that sensitivity to the awareness of ghosts. And one of the things I know that your work is both for yourself and helping other people to start learning how to teach people to cross over. What advice would you give to somebody who's listening to this? Like how can you distinguish between, am I sensing somebody, am I just sensing the generic, like run of the mill empathic overwhelm of feeling other people's feelings that are living in, you know, living in this time and place versus I'm picking up the sadness, the, the unreconciled, unfinished business of spirits or ghosts that are, that haven't been able to cross over. How do you tell the difference? What would you mm-hmm suggest for somebody yeah it's it's very hard until you can delve into your own past and understand your own energy you have to understand your energy versus somebody else's energy and you also need to figure out for yourself which of your senses is your strongest my recommendation is once you figured out what your top two senses are then you intensively study those senses Mm -hmm. so that you have senses that you trust implicitly. Yes. And and then you just follow the breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. There are so many different tools and techniques that a whole bunch of different spiritual uh, teachers can teach you. And it's your job to find the one that resonates the most because we all do it in a different way. Yes. So it's about getting to know yourself It's about falling in love with both your good and bad side so that you become the person, not your partner or your sister, your brother, your mother, or anybody. You are the person on the planet who knows yourself, your energy, and your past, your present, and your future the best so that you can determine energetically what is truth and what is false, and it's really difficult. I still constantly am tested by Archangel Michael and by Source Energy, they will send me false spirit guides all the time to test me. Mm. And it's all about trust in Source is the bottom line. When yes. As far as it goes back, it goes back to trust in Source Energy and you need to believe in self at such a fundamental love level that you then therefore trust in Source implicitly and yeah, I get tested. That's how I learn. And it's it's about understanding and forgiving yourself each time you step into a trap. Mm-hmm, and the traps mm-hmm. are there so that you can teach those traps to others so that they right. don't believe something. The hu- history of humanity on earth is the history of falling into traps about false messages from source. Yes, yes, yes. Well, and 
so much of, you know, one of the biggest challenges, I mean, you, you just said there's so many pieces to unpack here. I mean, you just said, like, you've dropped some jewels of wisdom into this podcast. And one of the ones is just know thyself, you know, like, it's, it's such a fundamental thing. And yet, and it sounds so simple, but it is probably the work we will spend the rest of like multiple incarnations working on is truly knowing ourselves and really recognizing like, and as you said, it's like you have to understand your own energy. You have to understand what's making you tick before you have the capacity to understand what isn't yours, what's mine, what's not mine. And, you know, the... I think that what happens for so many people is that what my guides and what my what sort what my counsel has been saying to me is we give all of you information and we share we impart truth to all of you but then your triggers your trauma your belief systems you know it's like everything gets filtered through this stuff and so many people when it really comes down to it are not fully willing to know themselves like mm -hmm. you know they might embrace one part of themselves but not another part of themselves mm. and so what I'm really hearing you saying is the first step in all of this work is knowing yourself because otherwise we fall into trap upon trap upon trap of false basically sort of false prophets and misinformation but also misinterpretation on our part like that's mm -hmm. what I've noticed is that it seems like the information might be coming to us, but it's us that's so vulnerable to misinterpreting it. Yeah, let's just yeah. take it back to the very beginning. I've had dragons around me the entire life. Right. I didn't notice them until, oh, a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're always there. The information is always there. It's just what are you ready for? And I am an impatient person. I want to be ready for everything at once but you can't. It's done in layers. Yes. And I guess my main message is if there's something going on in your life, you know you're not going insane. There is somebody out there who can help you in a way that is best for you. And it might take you five attempts to find the right people, but each one of those is also a breadcrumb. Yes, yes, yes. And it's such an important lesson. And I mean, you were talking about also, and we don't really have time to unpack this, but the fact that the first sort of intervention for this possession and not crossing over of the previous incarnation was kind of heavy handed, it sounds like. And as you said, yeah. you cried for for a, six months, a year, like you just nonstop. And that is another thing is like sometimes you'll find people and they have the skills or they have the knowledge, but they don't necessarily have the, either they're not the right fit for you, or maybe they don't have the finesse or the nuance of understanding like the timing of it, or the fact that they need to be super gentle and that they need to be gradual with the process. And, you know, so I really hear that that was, um, you got to the other, you're worse for the wear, you might be a little worse for the wear and tear, but you got to the other side of it. But I'm also imagining you learned as a healer, one of the most important lessons you could possibly learn, which is, this is not how I want to do this. Correct. And I'm, I'm very good friends with the person who was that person, but yeah. she taught by searching, I developed my own modality. Yes, exactly. So Katish, this is the point where I say, oh my goodness, Katish, I cannot believe how fast the time has gone by. And I really mean it. I mean, you and I could this conversation could go on for five hours and I'm sure we would be barely scratching the surface. There are so many pieces to this. Um, so before we sort of come to the top of the hour, I want to be sure that we cover anything else that just feels like you would absolutely kick yourself if you did not share this. Literally just, you are not going insane. The darkness is there to teach you a reason. If you're being blocked, investigate it. You will be you are, provided with resources to help you. If you are being blocked, investigate it. And, you know, and that is something I've been really, a lot of my guides have been showing me and really trying to, like, there's a, I don't know whether you have 
if you've ever had the experience of where you live, if you ever get icy roads, but where I live, um, when the roads get really icy, it can cause your car to skid. And one of the things that people automatically do when their car skids is that they reflexively cut their wheel in the opposite direction and try to drive away from the skid, as well as sometimes slam on their brakes. But the irony is that when you drive away from the skid, you actually create more momentum and traction for the skid. And a lot of times you, leave, you lose even more control of your car. And the way to navigate a skid is to drive into the skid and drive through it. And it seems to me that this is a big piece of what we're talking about here is instead of leaning away from it or trying to kill our egos or go away from this, it's like, no, we need to lean into the skid. We need to be willing to look at all of the different parts and address and heal it. Yes, there's a, and there's a very simple thing for that. The root cause of that is fear, right? Right. Where there is fear, there is evil, and the remedy is always love. So where you feel fear, go into it, throw love at it, and figure out the solution. Where you feel fear, go into it, throw love at it, and there is the solution. Mm. 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 Okay, so now we're going to do one of my favorite parts of this podcast, which is the time travel part of it, which I know since you listened to some episodes, you know what's coming next. And so uh, you already understand this idea of, you know, podcasts exist outside of time. They sit on a server and people listen to them for years and years. And I really believe that podcasts not only broadcast into the future, but there is a way that the message is also rippling back into the past. And so you and I are in this moment of time where the river of time is, or the fabric of time is folding over on itself. And not only can we give a message or send a message, could we send a message to a future Katish, but we can also send a message back to a younger version of your soul, a younger Katish, or possibly even somebody from way back. So my question is always, where, when, who are we going back to? And then what are you going to say? And not like, I would tell Katish this, but like, let's just broadcast it to her. Let's just like, we're there. You and I are back in time and we are with that part that needs to hear something. So where are we going? And then let it rip. Yeah. So we're going to, when my grandmother died, we're going to the uh, outside of the house. So the house is my grandmother's house and it's filled with all the grieving relatives. Mm. The grief is so overwhelming that I can't be in the house and I'm sitting outside and eventually I will be taken to my auntie's house because I cannot cope with the overwhelming amount of sadness. And I would just sit down next to her and explain that I'm feeling the love of the people who are missing Nana and that I have a superpower to feel love but it just feels like it hurts yes. and that it's going to be okay know that it is a superpower and when I'm ready to get my cape I'll get it ah when you're ready to get your cape you will get it and I love how you're also showing them because I've actually been getting a very similar download about grief is love and that it's like if we can really recognize grief is actually love and feel it for what it is the love it really transmutes everything so just you know it's okay. All of these people just really love this person, love Nana, and you're feeling the intensity of this love as they miss her. Mm. Okay, final question, Katish. How do people get in touch with you? Best way is to go to my website, which is my name, K A T I S C H E dot com. The second best way is if you think that. Anything that you've heard today is a little strange and there's a little part of you that needs proof. Go on to either YouTube or to my podcast and my entire podcast is 87 case studies. Yes, 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 yes. And your podcast is called? The Infinite Life with Katish Haberfield. Awesome. And you guys, all of this will be in the show notes. So you can jump on over to empathicmasteryshow.com if you're just listening. 
and you want to come back, we'll have Katisha's website, we'll have her podcast, her YouTube channel, all the things available to you so that you can you can access and connect with Katish and check it all out. Katish, this conversation has been so rich and satisfying. Thank you so much for really spending time talking with your guides, really doing the work to be prepared for this and to go to do a really deep dive with me. This has just been delightful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really empowering for me to discover all that stuff yesterday. I'm so glad. (laughs) That is awesome. Thanks so much. You're welcome. As we come to the end of this episode, I'd love to hear what you're taking from this show. Please jump over to empathicmasteryshow.com to leave your comments. In the show notes, you'll find a link to grab your copy of My Empathic Safety Guide, Three Basics for Finding Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And while you're there, please subscribe and follow this show. And thank you for your help sharing this show with the people who need it. Please help me to spread the word and send this podcast to friends or family members who need support living as highly sensitive empathic people. Then join me again when the next Empathic Mastery Show airs. Okay, one last time. Hop over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com for your empathic safety guide. And until next show, shine on. We need you and your gifts here on this planet. So please don't judge your empathic rainbow by colorblind standards.